Welcome in to another edition of the KSO Show. Mason Voth, Derek Young here with you from K-State Online. Monday edition where the Wildcats already have a commitment in the books for the day. So if you haven't checked out the uh, video that I did with Drew earlier on Jaquez Bradley Dimps, or Spradley Dimps, excuse me, uh, the latest commit for the Wildcats, a receiver out of the state of Texas, go watch that, get educated on it, up to speed on what the Wildcats are getting and their 10th commit of the 2024 class. As for what D.Y. and I are here for, it is to uh, just put a bow on the Wildcats' dominating performance over Houston, and we'll get into it, but, I mean, they won pretty easily, and it was one of those games where uh, it just it came really easy for K-State, and they didn't have to do a whole lot, and the numbers kind of reflect that. They were under 400 yards of offense. The, the yards per play number, which we'll get into, was a lot lower than what we expected, They just kind of did whatever they wanted to do, move the ball methodically down the field, killed a ton of clock, still put up 41 points and were efficient in what they did. Uh, So real quick, before we dive into the over-unders, D.Y., just some uh, general thoughts from K-State's win over Houston. Very efficient on offense still, though. So Mm -hmm. that's one takeaway I had. And 5.6 yards per play is not anything astronomical when you look and you see 41 points on the board. But if you eliminate garbage time, which, you know, I think fan does. Yeah. I think it was still around six yards per play. So still a really good number at the end of the day. They continue to be dominant. And I mean dominant on third down. Remember when we looked at the third down numbers against TCU, K-State was 10 of 13. And I believe TCU was two of 13. You look at the Houston game, both teams had 14 attempts. Kansas State converts on 10 of them. Houston only three. They are just flat out blasting the opponent in that phase of the game. They're doing the same in the red zone, although they didn't even have to defend the red zone against Houston. Houston never got inside the 20-yard line, which is wild, um, especially considering that I had Houston over 20 and a half points as one of my best bets. Well, you know, I'm I'm an idiot this week. My over-unders are better, as people will find out, and a clean game as well. Kansas State, one penalty all day, one penalty. Yep, it was uh, – well, in that first quarter, just felt like it flew by because K-State had the ball for so much of it. I mean, you, you go and look. K-State got the ball to start the game, and they went down the field. They took five and a half minutes off the clock, scored a touchdown, and then Houston had the ball right after that for close to four minutes. But they ended up having to punt, and that ended up being one of the longer drives of the day for Houston. They had seven plays, uh, 31 yards, which is kind of crazy. Actually, as I look at it now – uh, because of yardage and penalties and everything else, that was indeed Houston's longest drive of the day in terms of yards. They had two drives where they went 31 yards. Outside of that, the others were 24, 27, 26, and then some with negative yardage. It, it was not an easy day for the yeah. Cougars. And very business-like and ho-hum again for the defense because I'm just like, man, three points against TCU, zero against Houston – and I have the same takeaway as I did for the TCU game. Yep. Still nothing like overly splashy or flashy about it. It's just like, no, we just tackle you and you punt. That's all that happens. Um, uh, real quick, K-State had the ball for 20 minutes and 25 seconds of the first half. And uh, in the second half, they were a lot nicer. They let Houston actually possess it a little bit more. But just a dominant ball control and scoreboard came for K-State. Yeah, and and turns I always have thought and and you know some people will disagree with me. When you turn a team over on downs, I don't know why that's not considered a turnover because in some cases that's better than a turnover. Yes. You get a you get an interception when a team throws it 40 yards downfield versus turning over on downs, that's a benefit of 40 yards right there. I think turnover on downs is probably Should be a turnover, but at the end of the day, it's as good of a turnover. Chris Kleiman says that often. I totally agree with him. And although they're not forcing a lot or takeaways this year, when you're averaging in the the times that they're turning teams over on downs, um, I think they are. Because Kamai knows that it was six. (laughs) Yeah, no, I'm with you. I I, That would be one of those that uh, I would side and say that if the the NCAA wanted to change how stats were kept and said, hey, we're going to start counting – turnover on downs as actual turnovers. I think that makes a lot of sense because like you're saying, there's, there is a skill to being able to do that. If you're 
on a defense because typically you would think if a team is going for it on fourth down, it's a pretty reasonable amount of yardage that they'd have to pick up as in they should be able to do the one or two most of the time. And I think K-State's done pretty good this year. I'd have to look up what the official like fourth down defense numbers are. And then, yeah, I mean, you talked about K-State on third down. They were seven for seven in the first half. And prior to the game being into garbage time, well, I guess it was probably garbage time by the time the second half started, but by the time that K-State mailed it in and it became garbage time based on the personnel on the field, somebody would have to check this for me, but K-State was probably like 9 of 10 on third down at one point, maybe better. Uh, they finished the game, I believe, 10 of 14. So yeah. they were really good in that category uh, on Saturday, and uh, they, they have it going right now on offense. We talked about it and the Sunday show and fan kind of backed this up with numbers and, and K-State is incorporating the jet sweeps with the, the receivers a bit more. I just think that Colin Klein has found his groove and he has a full understanding of the tools at his disposal now for this offense. At the beginning of the year, he had a vision in mind, but it became clear, hey, we can't do this with this this group of guys. I have to find something different to do. He has now figured that out and he's got him executing at a very high level. I would agree. Going back to those third down numbers, if you want to look at the last two games, Kansas State is, I believe, 20 of 27 third down offense. Defense, 5 of 27. Pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. All right, let's roll on. Over-unders time, recapping last week's game with the over under set by our man Drew Galloway, who – we are Man. convinced is getting a job in Vegas after the season because he was on the money for a lot of these this week. Yeah. The, the DJ Giddens one is kind of creepy. <laughs> it is. It, yeah. He that eerily good on that one. Uh, all right. Let's start K state rushing yards. Drew said it at 260 and a half. He and I both said over, uh, and you thought that K state would do it, but you also expected some big plays in the passing game. You, you got it this right. You gained a game, and you get half credit for your logic behind the answer because, surprisingly, K-State had more passing yards in the game on Saturday than they did rushing yards, which I don't know how many people would have thought that there would be many games left on the K-State schedule where that would happen this season based on how the offense is working. I was right about the explosiveness in the passing game, though. They had three catches, three guys had catches of over 20 yards in the game. DJ Giddens, Will Swanson, and Phillip Brooks. Yeah, the uh, the passing game, they they found some guys to get involved. They did a good job with it, and it it has now become something that you feel a lot better about heading into the game with Texas, which we've talked about a lot, is uh, important. It's a different kind of passing team. Yeah. They, they, they don't necessarily use the receivers front and first and foremost, but man, the running backs and tight ends are just as effective. It doesn't really matter, I guess. Yep. All right. Uh, the next one, K-State leading player receiving yards, 75 and a half. This was a good line by Drew because the number ends up being very, very close. Phillip Brooks gets it done, though, 83 yards on the day, including the big 40-yard connection that he and Will Howard had in the game. Brooks also caught a touchdown pass. Um, I did not expect that, especially coming from Phillip Brooks. I think if you had said, hey, somebody is going to get to that number, there were probably four or five guys on the K-State roster I picked before Phillip Brooks because while Phillip Brooks has been successful and a, a valuable piece in the receiving game, it's typically, hey, he's going to catch a lot of balls for you, and that's about it. There's not going to be a ton of yardage attached to it. Not the case this time. Five for 83, uh, a good game for Phillip Brooks. And in the last two weeks, or three, two of the last three games, after we talked about he's not going up to get balls for you, he did it against Texas Tech, and the one that he had against Houston was pretty impressive. Yeah, I mean, I think he got all 83 of those in the first half. So um, another interesting fact. What I just saw something. Well, there's two somethings I saw, and I think it's one of them. They're both kind of weird. So DJ Ginn's had 25 receiving yards, right? 34 yards after the catch, though. How does that compute? Wait, say that again. DJ getting 25 receiving yards. Okay. But, but they credit him with 34 yards after the catch. Did he catch one way behind the line of scrimmage? Uh, yeah. Yeah. He, he, I guess maybe he, well, I don't know because his long of the day is 23 yards. 
So, but he caught one that they're giving him if you catch up behind the line of scrimmage, like on a screen. Yeah, I guess would they give you yards after the catch on that? I because it's really they, just they like they a long they pitch. Should have, they shouldn't, but they did. Okay, well, somebody that is much smarter than we are in terms of how stats get kept, just leave a comment for us somewhere, tweet at us, post it on the board, whatever you got, because this this has me perplexed, and this is a great catch by you, because yeah, I have and, no and, idea how that works. And 29 of Garrett Oakley's 36 yards came out of the catch. That, that one makes a little bit more sense, especially since what? He scored his touchdown pass that he scored on. He basically did everything. Um, I don't know. I don't know how this works. I'm, I am perplexed, but Hey, it is, it is what it is. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll figure it out from there. Uh, by the way, just so people are aware, D Y got this one right as well with the over. So, uh, he started off with a good start. Now this one, he complained about most of the game, uh, after it happened, DJ Giddens total scrimmage yards, 120 and a half. Drew and I went over and DJ Giddens saved our bacon. 121 total yards in the game for Giddens, uh, 96 of which came on the ground. He had another great game running the football, and then he had the 25 yards receiving in the game. Uh, so you can you can pout real quick about DJ Giddens going over for us and then give us a little bit on a, another good game for DJ Giddens. I was half a yard from going 3-0 and on the ones that I was different from you guys to where I really could have separated. Now, I only lead by two or three, I think, at this point, which is unflattering considering my performance on the day. Anyways, DJ Giddens, uh, it's either DJ Giddens or Treshawn Ward. Someone's having a good game. Neither have a bad game. So you, you like that tandem. Yeah, uh, you got to feel really good if you're K-State about how that's working out right now. And uh, DJ Giddens is proving himself. And I, I just, it's after everybody starts to kind of lean towards, okay, this guy has taken taken the job. Then it swings back the other way. It's just what this is going to be. I mean, you've got two talented running backs, and depending on the game and the day, uh, one of them will probably take the mantle for it. And you'll have some games like against TCU where they both go for 80-some yards, and they're they're going back and forth with each other, and it's a good thing. So uh, no problems there. Uh, the and next they need, one, yeah, they go needed ahead. Him. They needed him because he was only one of two players over seven yards of carry, uh, Jaden Jackson. Yeah continues to be a good ball carry. Got a little Malik Knowles to Jaden Jackson right now. And everybody else, 3.2 yards per carry or below. They didn't really run the ball well out, outside of DJ. Yeah, no, for sure. And, you know, it, it was something that Drew brought up, and this is uh, kind of goes into our video that we talked about with uh, Jaquez Bradley Dimps, but he mentioned specifically about K-State using their receivers in the jet sweep game is one of the things that had him interested in K-State was because he just saw how they were getting the ball into the hands of some of these guys, especially guys that are much better, you know, once the, the ball is in their hands and not necessarily when it's getting there. Uh, so that's a, a big deal. Uh, the next one up, Houston success rate. Uh, the number was set at 39.5%. Um, I'd have to look to see what the specific number is, just so everybody is aware. Uh, but we all took the under and the under uh, hit in the game. So there you go. Yeah, I, I, I know the under had to have hit. They didn't score any points. We'll put it this way. Um, the, the passing success rate for Houston was only 24. And the, the rushing success rate was 35. So they were both under 30. Yeah. 30, yeah. 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 Not, not, a, not a great day for Houston. As we, we discussed there with some of the offense and uh, how K State was able to, to get him off the field and make everything happen. I just, you know, this is a, this is a good spot right now for, for K State's defense uh, and, and how they're playing. I mean, we've seen them continue to grow. I think each group that had a question mark. That's kind of starting to go by the wayside. Um, you're probably still a little on edge about some things, especially in coverage, but they were really good again on Saturday. And uh, obviously it helped then at the end that the the defense up front with the, the line and some of the linebackers applying pressure now, they are getting more action on the quarterback. It may not be resulting in sacks, but it is forcing poorer throws. It is making them kind of get off schedule and run around like we saw Donovan Smith do, and ultimately he threw the pick to Will Lee. So uh, the defense is in a really good spot right now for K-State. Can't have any complaints. Give up three points in the last nine quarters. Yeah. 
Uh, all right, K State yards per play six point three. We all took the over, and it was really nowhere close by the end of the game. The final was, number ends up being five point six. Yeah, and it was six point one, six point two for most of the game. Probably about six when they got into garbage time. Still a great, great performance. Uh, six point three is a high number. We should have been careful. Yeah, but you know, K State had been executing at a really high level, and everything was kind of looking good there. The honestly, though, it just came down to how many plays K State was able to run that, and, and just get whatever they wanted. That and they didn't run the ball as well with the the QB run game yeah. wasn't necessarily there. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the first two drives of the day for K State, they ran a total of twenty seven plays, and uh, that's uh, that's that's a pretty high number considering the way that they'll operate it sometimes. Then the rest of the game, they were pretty quick about scoring. Uh, they also had some short fields to deal with uh, in some or instances. So just, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. K State just and the there were penalties as well. The Houston had the punt that K State got helped out on a penalty, so we were all wrong there, but it all worked out well for the Wildcats in the end. So there you have it. Those were the over unders from the week that was. Uh, let's dive into the Big Twelve real quick before we we skiddy on out of here. Uh, weird weekend for the league, which is kind of customary at this point. KU takes down Oklahoma after we both thought. Okay, there's no way Oklahoma comes out that flat, lays an egg after they played bad against UCF. They did it, and they did it in a masterful way against KU. Both teams tried to give the game away. Oklahoma just did it a lot better than KU. I think Fan probably said it best that you can watch Oklahoma and just see that they are a poorly coached team. And as we know, whether we like to admit it or not, since you know we're, we're always following the Cats, uh, Lance Leipold is a very good coach, and he yep. coaches really good football. And that was the difference maker between Oklahoma and KU. Yeah, that's going to be the difference maker a lot for KU. You hate them as much as you want. Their coaching will get them over the top. And here's a, here's a good way to illustrate that. Kansas entered the fourth quarter trailing. They turned the ball over twice, even though they were trailing and still yeah. won. Yeah. Yeah. In instances that should have just easily wrapped up the game, like yeah, you, you don't usually enter a fourth quarter, turn the ball over twice, or you you usually don't enter the fourth quarter on the losing side of the scoreboard, turn it over two more times, and then find a way to somehow win. Um, yeah. That tells you the coaching between the two sides complete mismatch, and also an illustration of despite the OU schedule being completely soft the rest of the way, the last two two weeks have told us they don't have the discipline to be considered an automatic lock to win the games they should. Yep. No, that's, that's very true. I mean, you, that's why all of a sudden, based off of how Oklahoma State just handled Cincinnati, and I think both of us, had, we didn't think O-State necessarily would lose, but I we did was, think that yeah. – that Cincinnati would make it tight and make it interesting. And that wasn't the case. So all of a sudden, I mean, OU going to Stillwater this weekend, there's a, I legitimately have to consider that Oklahoma state wins that game now. Yeah. Now I would probably pick OU still, but nothing would sh shock me in that game. And, and while we look at some teams and be like, man, you've been playing the wrong quarterback this year. Like we've said that a couple of different times about a couple of different teams in the Big 12. For Oklahoma State's like, were you playing the wrong running back? Because Ollie Gordon is just mm -hmm. a game wrecker. He might – is he the best – I mean, is he up for Big 12 Offensive Player of the I, Year? He might I be. think he has to be. I think at the moment that would be the pick is – uh, the way that he's going about things. I mean, he's been incredible. And Cincinnati, the best thing that they had going for him was their run defense, and he just squashed that. He was over 200 yards again, so an impressive Three showing row, for him. Right? Three yeah. weeks in a row for 200? Damn, yep. he's good. He is, he's killing it, I, and especially now that you know Dylan Gabriel didn't have a great game uh, against KU, so he would probably be the other guy that was up there uh, towards the top for consideration of Big 12 Player of the Year. And it's just yeah. that's not going to be the case. So I mean, Kansas State has some of the best offensive numbers in the league, but they're doing it with two quarterbacks, two running backs, two yep. tight ends, <laughs> seventeen different guys that'll catch a pass in a game. Yeah, uh, I mean, we, we talked about it this morning in in the text exchange, but you know, K State has put up over forty points the last two weeks, just killed teams, 
and they haven't had a single guy win a Big 12 award. And <laughs> it's because every single person on the team that has seen action is doing things, whether it's, you know, the, the yeah. first 11 guys on the field or, you know, Matthew Mashmeyer at the end of the game for K-State. Yeah, yeah Mashmeyer. That was the most productive eight snaps in the history of college football, probably. <laughs> um, well, I will say – uh, maybe and I'd have to look at the stats of or the performance of the guy that got it. And I, I forget who got it off the top of my head, to be quite honest. But I think Will Lee probably had a right to be defensive player of the week in the Big 12. I mean, you get, yeah. you get a pick, you get a few tackles, you force a fumble. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, he, he definitely could have laid claim to that. So the way that the Big 12 shook out this week, we now have uh, a number of teams tied to the top of the lead. <laughs> yeah. Uh, four and one. Five teams, OU, Iowa State, Oklahoma State, Texas, and K-State. And they all play each other this weekend. Iowa Outside. State, they're playing KU. But KU right there lurking at three and two now. Uh, and they've got a, a little bit of a stake in this. So uh, we'll have to see how this thing kind of ends up playing out. But what do you expect first from K-State, Texas this week? And then uh, everything that will fall in place after that since the Cats and Horns kick it off at 11 a.m. with Big Noon kickoff. Uh, I love how they did it as a triple header with those three games as well. I thought that I, I like it. Sometimes it doesn't always work that way. So that's really cool for K state, Texas, you know, maybe a line of scrimmage game here, a turnover game. I think those, I think these teams are, you know, surprisingly because you have a 25 and a seven and it's Texas talent for K state talent. When you add in the fact that it's Malik Murphy and not Quinn Ewers, when you add in the fact what K state's done for the last few weeks, from a number standpoint, a very even, evenly matched two, two teams. I still think raw talent, Texas trumps Kansas State by a sizable margin. But if K-State tackles well, plays good on the line of scrimmage, and wins the turnover battle, and then I think you're probably in business and have a pretty close game on your hands or, or have the upper hand. Yeah, I think this is a game where, I mean, a couple of weeks ago I would not have given K-State much of a chance at all. And now all of a sudden the way things have changed and you consider the fact that uh, Texas is in a spot where they're going to be playing a backup quarterback in all likelihood with Malik Murphy, who wasn't asked to do a whole lot against BYU, K-State's going to give themselves a real chance. And it's also important to note that K-State has already faced some of the best rushers, not just in the Big 12 this year, but in the country. And they've done a pretty good job of locking them down. Jonathan Brooks is another one in Texas is really all about the run game. I mean, we knew this the last couple of years when Bijan Robinson was there, but especially now that Quinn Ewers is out, and so you're relying on a backup quarterback, and you want Jonathan Brooks to, to blow up for you. And K-State, they just have to limit those big plays. I mean, you look at Texas's run numbers, and Fan talked about this a couple of weeks ago with us because I was curious, and uh, it's, it's, it's right on the money. Texas, actually, in terms of just like a – consistent run game it's not really there but their explosiveness in the run game is what's important and so for k-state you're going to give up some big runs at some points make sure that they're not the backbreakers though that can happen and limit them to like a 20 yard run instead of a 35 yard run or something like that or the the big one that busts off a, a, a touchdown that kills momentum or something along those lines and i think k-state's defense is playing in a way that they can do it right now they're just going to be doing it against one of the better offensive lines they face this season. Yeah, two things come to mind. The fact that they don't have Quinn Ewers and they're going with Malik Murphy. He's one, he's still a five star quarterback. So he's got a big arm, but the decision making won't always be there. It's it it nullifies their best weapons because their best weapons are actually Xavier Worthy, Adonai Mitchell, and Jatavian Sanders. Three absolute dynamite weapons in the passing game. Well, when you have Malik Murphy instead of Quinn Ewers, that really takes away some of their value because it's harder to get them the ball on a consistent level. So that kind of evens the playing field a bit, um, but you do have to stop that running game, and they're just more explosive than anything. Yeah. We'll offensively, see. And then offensively, I, what I struggle and why I, I'm starting to think this could be a pretty defensive game, which <laughs> is complete inverse of yeah. what the Wildcats have been involved in throughout this year, is Texas stops the run. And Kansas State has had a hard time – building a passing game without the threat of a run yeah i need to uh you need know you may know it off the top of your head you know what the total was set at for k-state texas this weekend no but i can look at it uh, real 51 quick. and a half 51 okay. and a half boy this this feels like 
I don't know. This feels like a game to me that's like 24, 21, something like that. If it's, if it's going to be a close game and I don't know, I mean, this probably sounds silly because I mean, I guess there's a world where K-State can win in a blowout or Texas wins a close game, but I feel like if K-State keeps it close, this is probably a game they win then. Um, if, if it's somewhere within a touchdown, I think K-State will probably be victorious because right now you have all of your pieces falling into place at the right time, and I know that you've played lesser talent, but Texas has also played some lesser talent over the last two weeks, and I know that the numbers end up looking great against BYU. They, they weren't just jumping all over the Cougars. They just got fortunate they were facing a bad offense. And they struggled with Houston. I mean, they got up 21 nothing and let them come back, and they were tied late, and K-State handled the Cougars. And I know that it's not an apples-to-apples apples type of thing, but it is something to consider. And I, the way Will Howard is playing again, the way that everybody's just working together, K-State has better experience right now than what this Texas team does, which seems odd to say, but it is the case. And I – I like K-State if they can keep it close. I just don't know that they can. That's why I probably lean more towards the side of like seeing this thing ended up being like a, you know, 31 to 17 type game in favor of Texas. I, there's obviously still all that talent there and Texas has the loss to Oklahoma, but we, we can't forget that this is still a really good team, even without Quinn Ewers playing. Cause I, I, he makes a difference, but I don't know that it's actually as significant as some people want to think. That's fair. Thirty-one seventeen would still be under. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So we'll have to see how it goes. I guess uh, that's what we're taking this weekend. That's the play. Put it in best bets for me already. Under in the game. So we'll uh, we'll do that, and uh, that will come on Friday when we have the pregame pod and the preview for K State in Texas. We'll have one more show in the middle of this week. That will go up on Wednesday, where we recap what Chris Kleiman had to say and everything going on with the Wildcat football team as they prepare for Texas, which could go a long way in determining on if they're going to go back to the Big 12 championship as well. And one other thing to keep in the back of your head, basketball season unofficially starts Wednesday as well as the Cats will play their first and only exhibition game of the year against Emporia State in Bramlage Coliseum. So we'll have coverage from that as well. And then basketball season officially one week away uh, when the Cats and the Trojans play out in Las Vegas. So, Exciting times, busy time of the year, but K-State in position to do well in both things they got going on. So that will do it for Derek Young. I'm Mason Voth. Thank you for watching and listening to the KSO Show. We'll be back with more on Wednesday here on the K-State Online YouTube and podcast pages, and we are always on over at On3, kstateonline.com, where you can get all the latest and greatest news on the Wildcats.